it's 12 o'clock, so we will get started. Thank you so much to everyone for being with us today for this webinar um, focused on the issue of transforming consumer engagement, health system resilience, and the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is a joint webinar between Health Consumers New South Wales and the Australian Centre for Health Engagement Evidence and Values at the University of Wollongong. My name is Stacey Carter. I'm the director at Achieve at the University of Wollongong, and we have a fantastic panel with us today. You will get to um, meet all of them shortly. Um, before we go into the content of today's seminar, though, I want to acknowledge country. Um, so we were all we are all on different countries today. Those of us who are in Australia and different Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander country, and we acknowledge that all of this is unceded land. Um, we are on the land of the Dharawal people here uh, in Wollongong, and I want to read the University of Wollongong Acknowledgement of Country. So we acknowledge that Country for Aboriginal Peoples is an interconnected set of ancient and sophisticated relationships. The University of Wollongong spreads across many interrelated Aboriginal countries that are bound by this sacred landscape and intimate relationship with that landscape since creation. From Sydney to the Southern Highlands to the South Coast, from freshwater to bitter water to salt, from city to urban to rural. The University of Wollongong acknowledges the custodianship of the Aboriginal peoples of this place and space that has kept alive the relationships between all living things. The University acknowledges the devastating impact of colonization on our campus's footprint and commit ourselves to truth telling, healing, and education. So we're going to move into the content of the webinar now. The webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available both on the Achieve website and the Health Consumers New South Wales website as soon as we can make those available. So I'm now very pleased to be able to hand over to Dr. Anthony Brown, the, um, ex the Exec Director of Health Consumers New South Wales, who's going to chair. So over to you, Anthony. Thank you so much, Stacey, for that very warm introduction. Um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge that I'm coming, uh, I'm on the, the land of the Gadigal people in Eastern Sydney and also pay my respects to Aboriginal elders and to any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. Um, as Stacey said, I'm the Executive Director of Health Consumers New South Wales. For people not familiar with Health, Consumer, New, Health Consumers New South Wales, we're a peak body for health consumers, patients, carers, family who use health services. And we work really hard to build the capacity of consumers and health services to work together. This, I'm also very excited to be, um, to be here and very excited about the work that we're talking um, about today. This project came about because early in the pandemic, I think it was in April, 2020, we decided that Health Consumers New South Wales, that we really needed um, some more on the ground intel about what's happening for people. And so we formed what we called the Consumer Leaders Task Force, which was a group of about 25 uh, consumer representative leaders from around New South Wales, who we felt had good links with local communities, were involved very much with local health services and involved in those health services consumer engagement processes. Uh, what we found early on that people were telling us amongst all the important things and concerns people had about the pandemic was actually people were telling us that their local engagement processes that they were so involved in had fallen away for various reasons. And we wanted to get a better understanding of what was going on there. Over the past few years, we've been working very closely with uh, Stacey and the team at Achieve. And we had a number of conversations about this and thought this was something that we thought um, we really, that, that was a, a fantastic research opportunity for us to understand what was going on here. And so we decided to put together a research proposal to to investigate the experiences of those consumer representatives. Now that research proposal was, was not successful, but I think we were also committed to finding out what was happening, that this was a, a project 
that we committed to um, uh, to run uh, without external funding. And uh, we're really pleased with the results and uh, what we'll be sharing with you today. So uh, this work was actually identified by those consumer representative leaders. During the course of the conversation today, we'll be using the term consumer representative and consumers interchangeably, but most of the time we will be talking about or referring to people who are in those consumer representative or consumer advisor roles within health services and involved in the planning, delivery, and even in some cases, governance um, of health services. So just a bit about the language that we're using there. What I'd like to do now is introduce you um, to our three speakers today um, and start with uh, Dr. Patty Shea. Patty's a lecturer in public health um, and a research fellow at the Australian Centre for Health Engagement, Evidence and Values um, at the University of Wollongong. Patty's a sociologist specialising in political, social and cultural aspects of healthcare and health service. And her current research focuses on consumer orientated health technologies and consumer participation in healthcare decision making. She is the chief investigator of this study and led the data collection and analysis. I'd also like to introduce people to Layla Hallam. Layla is a consumer representative and advocate who's focused on facilitating, contributing, and embedding the immense value and knowledge that patients and their families bring to uh, improving healthcare systems, service design, delivery, and evaluation. Uh, Layla has been working um, as a healthcare consumer representative for almost 20 years now, and she's the co chair of the Health Consumers New South Wales Consumer Leaders Task Force, the work of which sparked this con conversation and the conceptualization of this study. Uh, and Layla was a co-researcher uh, with Patty and shaped the design of the study and collaborated um, in, an, in analyzing the de-identified data. And finally, Associate Professor Robin Clay Williams. Robin is an internationally recognized uh, regarded health services researcher and a leading exponent of resilient healthcare. Robin leads a research centre, a research stream, sorry, at the Australian Institute of Health and Innovation at Macquarie University in the field of human factors and resilience in healthcare. Her expertise is in creating health systems that can function effectively in the presence of complexity and uncertainty and her research bridges the gaps between theory and practice by developing products and processes that are usable and ready for implementation. Robin was instrumental in guiding the conceptual elements of this study in terms of understanding its implications for health system resilience, sparking our insights into how major disturbances such as the COVID-19 pandemic was crucial in transforming, the, transforming and strengthening the ways in which consumer representatives work in New South Wales. So I would like to now um, hand over to Patty, who is going to present to us the main findings of the study. Um, and after we hear from Patty, from Patty, we'll go into a panel discussion uh, with Patty, Layla, and Robin. Now, during Patty's presentation and the panel discussion, I would invite people to please post any questions in the question and answer dialogue box um, that you come at the bottom of the screen. Um, we may not be able to cover all the questions that are asked, um, but we do ask people to please, as we go along, put your questions in. And for other people, please review the questions um, and upvote the questions that you're most interested in. And we'll start at the end of the, um, the panel will start by asking the questions that have received the most votes. So please use the, the Q&A function as, as we go along. Um, but now I'll sort of hand over to Patty and invite Patty to present the findings of the study. Thank you, Anthony. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. So this is a brief uh, study uh, overview of the study findings. 
And uh, before I start, I'd like to um, thank the study advisory group, uh, which comprised of Anne-Marie Hadley, who's the chief experience officer um, from the Ministry of Health, La Lee Kirkwood, and also Patricia Cummins from the um, Agency for Cl Clinical Innovation in New South Wales, and also Professor Annette Brunick meyer who is a professorial fellow here at Achieve um, at University of Wollongong. Now, um, they very kindly uh, steered us through the study and gave us plenty of fantastic advice. So um, thank you to them. Um, so just a really brief overview of the study aims, which um, Anthony has already, um, you know, given you a great background of. Um, the main study uh, aim was to document the accounts of consumer engagement uh, during the, particularly the first part of the COVID uh, pandemic pandemic. Uh, among uh, consumer representatives um, in the health system. And then analyzing these events through the concept of health system resilience um, in, uh, yeah, from that perspective. So um, it was, it, the study came out of the feedback and observation of the changes in the way that consumers were uh, engaging with each other and in uh, healthcare decision-making during that first sort of disturbing, uh, dis disruptive period of COVID in early 2020. And uh, just as a brief overview for those of you who may not be familiar with um, health system resilience, it's a bit different to what we mean by individual level resilience in terms of say um, childhood development or you know, psychological um, aspects of resilience. But we're talking about um, a system. So components um, that's made of individual individuals, groups of people, say policies or resources, and the way that they interact with each other um, as a system has, uh, and, and resilience is about how that system adjusts to uh, disruptions, changes, adapt to um, you know, new ways of working. And within that um, uh, health system resilience theory, there's a very interesting phenomenon called uh, panaki, which is about how shocks and disturbances actually break the networks and the way that people usually work in that system and release different types of energy and form new ones. And that then sets off a new cycle of adaption and renewal. And that is actually what gives this, uh, a system a particular strength or resilience, if you'd like. Um, and I hope to, you know, give you more information about that as we go um, in, in, in this webinar. So the study design was a collaborative study um, between researchers like myself, uh, Stacey and Robin, with uh, cons uh, consumers and consumer reps um, uh, like Layla and Anthony. We collaboratively designed um, the study and we, although I was the main person who was responsible for data collection, we um, uh, co-analyzed them together, the de-identified data together. Uh, and that, and we were supported by the advisory group. So this was a qualitative in-depth interview study with 30 health consumer representatives in New South Wales. And we, uh, we interview two specific cohorts across New South Wales. And I will tell you a little bit about them um, in the next slide. So the first cohort that we interviewed were the, uh, new, the Leaders Task Force, which meant Anthony mentioned. So this is a group of um, experienced consumer representatives who have been working uh, as advocates um, for and sort of representatives of consumers within healthcare organisations. And they got together in the early part of the pandemic um, and uh, were, you know, working together, producing research papers. And the second cohort, um, once we interviewed this particular group, um, our advisory group very, um, you know, wisely advised us to go a bit more diversely into uh, people who weren't part of the leaders task force and see if that we also observed sort of the proactive networking that was happening in this, you know, in uh, in the leaders task force. And this was a more diverse. Um, group of consumers from particularly rural and regional areas, and we included uh, uh, members of the culturally and linguistically diverse community, the called community. So there's a quick breakdown of um, whom we interviewed. So um, we had a good spread between metropolitan, regional and rural. And then we had um, 
also a good spread. We had uh, quite a few uh, consumer reps in the study who were um, fairly new to consumer represented representative work. And then we had another group, of course, primarily from um, the first cohort who had more than seven years experience. Uh, about two thirds identified as um, female and then a third were male. So these were, um, they worked quite in, in quite a number of different organisations. So many were uh, consumer or community representatives from in local hospital. Um, they were also working in LHD, some were in uh, primary health networks and um, some did more than one of them. And then others were also in NGOs. So the study's findings in brief was that in the very beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic around that sort of early part of 2020, around about March and April, it was a very interesting period of time because the bushfires had just ravaged New South Wales in that earlier part of 2020. And then we quickly got into the lockdowns in um, late March and early April. And there was a sudden halt in the consumer engagement activities that were uh, that consumers felt were almost routine or regular meetings that were set by the health organizations that they were working with. And a lot of this had, you know, they had come to expect to, to do so um, because of standard two. But the pandemic was sort of a it it shifted um, the health organizations into a command control kind of approach. Um, because it was a very, uh, you know, quick, uh, it was a crisis that needed to be dealt with um, in, in that manner. And consumer reps in the study, you know, told us that this was an understandable um, period of time where, you know, th th these regular meetings, be it face-to-face -face or online, had to be halted um, because of all the energy had to be concentrated on pa the pandemic response. Um, so although that, this was the recognition. What it also showed to them was that the previous arrangement of um, the consumer engagement was not actually as strong, strong as previously thought. And the expectation that after this initial period of um, pausing, consumers would be you know, reactivated in, uh, in terms of being involved, but that didn't actually happen. So uh, what was really interesting was you know, the leaders' task force was rose out of a, 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 a need to, to want to contribute to the pandemic response. Um, many of them weren't involved in um, decisions about um, the visitation policies, for example, that um, was about uh, disease control, but it weren't about patient care in the dynamic way that consumers felt it was needed. So um, they got together and they formed um, the consumer networks and, and, and led their own research and produced the visitation policy that many of you may know about and also the uh, telehealth um, uh, uh, research paper. And that was really interesting because they were used to working in silos, you know, with, within the organisation. And for many, it was the first time that they got together and worked with each other. Um, and in the cohort B um, participants that we interviewed, it was really interesting because uh, they actually did, uh, we found that there were more community engagement, sort of the tr more traditional um, led kind of community actions, such as organizing town halls and tapping into resources such as local businesses or local community groups to draw um, political support to um, input into various um, you know, uh, healthcare decisions and, and forming their own networks uh, to enable them to contribute to uh, pandemic related responses, but also non COVID um, health related issues as well that they felt that they were excluded in during this time. Um, however, it was this this wasn't always the case, um, especially in called communities, for example, there were more disconnections and challenges within these communities and they, they didn't feel like they were able to be as proactive um, or as you know had the kind, kind of access to networking as other consumers did. Um, so interestingly enough many people said that um, during COVID the ability to network with each other um, 
and uh, develop more consumer-led responses was actually a silver lining despite COVID being such a devastating pandemic and that there were outcomes and impacts of consumer-led engagement. So other than the research publications um, and the outcomes that the community specific outcomes um, that they were able to lobby for, it was also the other aspects of working together. So it was a sense of confidence and motivation, feeling like they could take ownership over the agenda setting um, in healthcare decisions. And so in a sense, um, COVID was a circuit breaker that allowed them to actually reimagine or reset the, the new ways of working rather than... Uh, just responding to the agenda that's set by the health organizations and the regular routine engagements that um, they had become used to. Uh, COVID allowed them to sort of find new ways and new, new um, arenas uh, to work together. So that was really positive. Uh, so the quickly the insights and the learning from the study. So in terms of health systems resilience, it was so, Resilience is about the ability with, to withstand and transform through a shock or disruption and growth and strengthen via a cycle of adaption. So in that sense, the pandemic put a lot of stress on the health system. And what it did was it exposed the brittleness of a system-led consumer engagement process, processes that had um, been the status quo before COVID, but it set up new ones. So in, in using that uh, theory of Panaki, what it did was that it broke or it halted the previous, uh, the, the, the previous relationships, um, but it allowed new ones to form. Um, and that sort of, the, the pandemic was also like a kind of stress that reset those relationships and allowed uh, new ways of, um, for consumer reps to uh, work together and create um, responses. So um, not only does this study show that uh, consumer reps were ready and had capacity to lead and shape the relevant aspects of pand pandemic responses, um, their perspectives were also quite unique and essential. It was very different to, um, you know, the clinicians' responses. They were uh, much more of a biomedical um, perspective on uh, on disease control. Um, it was a much more patient-oriented, patient-centered approach that was very unique and essential um, and also community-specific, of course. Um, but of course, we have to say that the experiences and outcomes were also quite diverse. Um, it wasn't um, all, uh, you know, uh, roses and chocolates everywhere, um, you know, that people had different experiences. Uh, I personally, and Layla would uh, hopefully agree with me, the co-research and the co-design process was absolutely um, fantastic learning process for us. Um, it's both a commitment to consumer partnership um, in, 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 that, in that principle, but it also really enhanced research rigor. And we'd like to, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the panel discussion as well. Uh, so in terms of the study limitations, so this is limited, this study was limited to the early periods of the pandemic in 2020 and 2021. The two cohorts were interviewed in two time periods. And so, you know, their recollection or their experience might be quite different. Um, and the study participants that we selected um, were not intended to be a generalizable sample of all the consumer reps in New South Wales, um, but we hope that the reflections on resilience and self-organization um, can, uh, well, I think the literature internationally has shown that there are actually some similar experiences, but hopefully it can be applied um, elsewhere as well. Uh, and in terms of recommendations, uh, hopefully planning and policy making for the future crisis uh, could uh, include the use of new and existing consumer engagement infrastructure that's uh, built during and before COVID uh, and the consumers could and should take that lead to determine this kind, this engagement um, and to support the cycle of adaption that the shock and changes triggered by the pandemic, there is a real unique opportunity to harness the new current and the new connections that we've formed. So um, please contact me if you'd like more information about the study. And this is also 
uh, now published in an open access paper in Health Expectations. And I can pop the link in the uh, Q&A for you as well if you'd like to access that. I'll hand it over back to Anthony. Fantastic. Thank you, Patty. I was just having a moment trying to find the unmute button. Um, thank you so much, Patty. As people can see, uh, this really is quite an ex exciting study and I, those uh, findings about how health consumers came together and um, uh, the opportunities that this big disruption um, of the pandemic, pandemic created, I think are really um, exciting and worth exploring. And that's what we'd like to do now, <coughs> excuse me, what we'd like to do now in our panel discussion. I'd remind people to please keep the questions coming and use the questions dialog to both um, add questions and to vote on um, the questions that you'd like to see asked. Um, and I'll just move now um, uh, to Layla and ask, La and Layla, um, as both a consumer representative and, and a co-researcher, um, we're really interested in your reflections on um, the study and keen to hear your thoughts on what you think we learned about health consumer representatives um, from this study. Thank you, Anthony. Um, I think when um, the pause happened with COVID, which I think at the time most of the consumer reps actually fully understood, you know, the, the health system was going through a fairly intense and very uncertain period. And um, when the pause happened, I think um, one of the things that did come out as a result of that was the fact that most of the consumer reps were actually isolated. So it took a while for people to actually work out that a whole lot of consumer reps were in the same position. And I think one of the first thing it did, it made when we did come together, um, it actually made us self-reflect a bit, you know, look inwards and say, well, what is it that we're meant to be, you know, what, what is it that a consumer rep is meant to be and who do we represent and what value do we actually bring if at the time then you need us the most, um, we're actually not being able to be involved. And actually it was a really good thing for us to do because it forced us to think about, well, who is it that we actually represent? And that was probably one of the first things that... Um, that the the study or the the actual process of coming together actually showed us is that we needed to be far bigger than our own uh, than our own opinions and experiences and i think up until now most of us operated in isolation so it gave us an opportunity to actually connect up with each other which i think very few of us had actually done in the past so we've done so informally but we'd actually never actually come together as a group to talk about specific things and covid just happened to be one of the triggers that allowed that to happen so it allowed us to really think about well what is the value that we bring and how can we do it to support the health system at, at the time of crisis how could we actually contribute to what was needed and what is it that what is the value that we bring that the health system doesn't have without us? And I think that was probably the big thing about trying to um, work out. We had to find ways to tap into our patients and families so that we could work out what was happening in the ground, so that we could bring that information together. That made us better informed. It made us better able to talk about things. Moved us from an opinion piece to actually more into um, contributing the unique patient perspectives in in a more knowledgeable informed and then allowed us to be um, more effective in when we were able to reflect those patient perspectives back to the systems in a way that the system could use um, so I think there were lots of learnings and I think um, so that was in a way that was happening in the metro area so in the city areas but in the country areas they were doing the same things just differently and I think that was the beauty of it. What we suddenly discovered is that actually we're capable of doing things more than we currently do. So in addition to all the ways that we currently operate, it actually gave us an opportunity to find more ways that we can contribute and also look to our, um, our consumer reps in the country, in the smaller country towns to look at how they do it. And then we're able to compare notes as, you know, um, the study actually allowed us to reflect on those differences 
and in a way bring them all together so we could work at you know so that we could work out what could work broadly and for both groups so I think there was a lot of self-reflection from a consumer rep perspective but there was also a whole lot of learning and then a whole lot of knowledge building that we were then able to bring into the system and that's probably the biggest piece I'd say that um that the study was actually able to unearth um, may I jump in really quickly, if that's okay, Leila? I've um, I know that we were going to answer the questions from the audience um a little bit later, but I think Terry's um question about do you have examples of how the consumers led and shaped the COVID response? And I think it would be good time for, to bring this in early now because um I wanted to go back to the visitation policy um the, the visitation piece of research and the policy paper that um the leaders task force. Uh, produced and also compare and contrast that to uh, you know between the two cohorts so the the visitation research um, paper that the leaders task force produced was um was done by this particular group themselves and it was this was before um I, I think across New South Wales uh, the local hospitals were um doing their own sort of visitation policy as they were going, even though that was there was a very strict sort of overall um, uh, uh, approach to visitation during COVID. Um, and what was really interesting was that um, it was it, it was well cited by um, many of the LHDs once it was produced by the consumers. It was the sort of the first time that the consumers were uh, producing a piece of work that was from consumers' voice. Um, and, and so that was from the leaders' task force. And it was quite interesting because another group of consumers from a particular uh, local hospital, they actually got together and lobbied their own local hospital to make a particular exception for um, birthing mothers to allow more than um, you know more than one um, accompanying uh, visitor with them and so it, so the this particular locally led specific um, visitation change was done by it was done by that small group of consumers themselves, but it wasn't sort of statewide. Uh, whereas the leaders task force research was actually became uh, um, uh, considered by um, almost every almost every uh, facility within New South Wales. And I know, you know, Leila, I just wanted to see if you wanted to comment a little bit more about that too. Um, yeah, I will, because the, um... I think that's a really good example. The uh, prior to that, there had been no real vehicle to be able to put consumer um, perspectives, the things that were important to the patients and families. And at the time it was visitation. It was a really big thing. We were operating very quickly. And the easiest thing to do was to essentially shut down the hospitals. And of course, you know, of course patients were coming in, but you know, one of the quick ways that we were able to manage things was to say, hey, family, friends, look, you know, just stay away because, <laughs> you know, we're, we're battling trying to do this right now. And I think there are a whole lot of consequences that the system were very aware of, services were very aware of, but certainly um, as patient reps, we were hearing. And I think the, the difference between the two groups was the fact that we had actually come together and had a very systemic way of capturing this information. So with um, facilitation by Health Consumers New South Wales, it meant that we were able to have a very structured, we had a much more formal, organised way of capturing this information and bringing it forward. But what um, our colleagues in the smaller country towns were doing was what we have always done and what they have always done, but they were working in their own space. And quite frankly, up until that period, so were we in the metro areas. If we were influencing, we were more influencing our LHDs or our facility or our specific service. So we had just stepped up something that we've probably, um, that our community, um, our country colleagues were probably much better at. They were much better networkers than in the city we were because, hey, they have lunch. You know, they're they're going into the supermarket with their, um, with their with staff members of, of the local hospitals. So, 
you know, there was much more an ability to have discussions that in the city were just much harder to have. So we had to be more systemic and we had to be more organised in how we received and delivered the information, but it allowed us to lift it to a system level. That's fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Layla. And actually, speaking of that systems level, I, I'd sort of like to, um, to ask Robin, like based on these findings, what, what do you think these findings have to say um, to health systems resilience? And what are some things that um, health systems can learn from, from these findings, do you think? Thanks, thanks, Anthony. Um, well, it was a tremendous experiment, uh, in a natural experiment in systems resilience. Like we all think our systems are resilient, but we don't know until they're actually challenged whether they're going to be able to cope or not. And I think we saw like really it, it aligned with the type of resilient theory. We saw what we would expect to see. So, so when you get a crisis like that, um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the structures and formal structures within an organisation tend to collapse. So, so because the consumer representative role was uh, was really organisational driven. So it was a very structured role. Um, those bonds were quite brittle and they broke quite quickly. So, so we saw things like you know engagement was halted or even where it was continued, you would just get a one-way passing of information. So not proper engagement at all. And really you would see um, within a normal system, any of the sort of bonds. So if you think perhaps of the consumer representatives as boundary spanners, because they're both within and outside the system. So connecting the consumer to the system. Um, it's really the elasticity and adaptability of that bond um, that's either resilient or it's not. And we saw like, in the previous system that it, it wasn't very resilient at all. A lot of those bonds were brittle and they broke. Um, but as Patty said, um, that when you do get this system crisis, you get a tremendous releasing of energy, um, which is then available to restructure and to reconnect in, in different ways. And I think the consumer representatives were able to take advantage of that um, and were able to reorganise, particularly um, the leadership task force um, at, a, at a sort of state level, but also at, at a more local level, uh, some of the more regional and remote representatives were able to reorganise at a local level as well um, to reinitiate that. So what we would expect now is we would expect the system to be more resilient in terms of the consumer representatives um, because you have um, increased the interconnectedness of, of the relationship between the reps and the organisation. Um, we would expect theoretically that to be quite strong and robust and, and much less likely to fracture in event of a new challenge. Um, and also um, the learning that's occurred uh, will also increase system resilience. So we would expect that that will contribute to system resilience as well. So, so we would anticipate that, um, that you will be more resilient to future challenges. Um, I guess if we think of it in terms of um, maybe a specific or a general resilience, is the healthcare system itself was quite resilient to specific resilience to COVID. So managed to cope quite well um, in dealing with COVID. But when you look at general resilience, that ability to deal with a specific thing took all the energy away from the rest of the system. Mm -hmm. And we saw those bonds break, not just with consumer representatives, but in lots of other areas of the system. Um, as researchers, for example, we were thrown out of the hospitals as well. Um, so, so a lot of you know, these sort of bonds were broken. But we would expect now that uh, that in the future, our general resilience, particularly with groups like the consumer reps that have now got a greater in interconnectedness and more communication, will be much more robust. That's um, fantastic. Thanks. Thanks so much, Robin. And I think this is really um, resonating with, um, with uh, sort of other people online. That there's a comment that was added to the... Um, the Q and A box about this being a great example of systemic advocacy across the complex system that, that is health, and an opportunity around the um, online engagement, and that we've for a network of of consumers, you know, that that's supported by a consumer organisation. Um, one of the things uh, health consumer representatives have a saying. Um, that you know, if there's no seat at the table, then bring a chair. And I think this was actually an example where in some cases the table was taken away. So, so we built our own. Um, so, and again, yeah, that um, 
just that expectation that we would be involved if we couldn't get in through this door, then we'd <laughs> we'd we'd work out another way way to do that. Um, I did want to sort of reflect a bit and ask a bit now about what do you think we need to take forward from this study? What what are the things that um, with this learning, what 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 can we take forward um, to, um, I suppose, to make sure, I, I really like that concept of brittleness that, that Patty mentioned and, and uh, I think Robin um, talked about as well. And we had these systems that actually when the, when the, the whole health system was shook, they sort of, they broke away. And I'm just wondering how we can um, build back systems that are less brittle and how we might, might do that. Um, so I might just ask for um, people's reflections on that and also welcome any reflections that any of the participants might have. If you've got comments about how you think um, we can, what, what the system can do to learn from this, uh, please add those to the Q&A box and please keep adding questions and upvoting those questions as well. But um, Layla, what's your, your thoughts about what we can do now? Um, I think there's a few key things. Um, one of the things that we've probably has come out of all the work that we've done, both with the Leaders Task Force and also um, what we saw happening um, in our community area, in our uh, in the smaller uh, rural and remote areas, um, is this idea of connection. And I think um, networking our consumers is not something that has been a priority. I don't think we've, we don't have the structures in place. We don't have the processes in place. I think so one of the key things is to maintain and build on those networking opportunities to bring consumers together. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I think um, one is that we do move from Layla's opinion to a much more rigorous, robust, more informed um, position that then has more weight and we move from opinion to expertise and I think that's pretty important um, the other thing is that I think we shouldn't lose our opportunity now to um, the confidence there was confidence that was built by doing this and what that has allowed us to do is initiate discussions that we didn't have the opportunity to before and so I think that if there are two things that we should maintain, it's our interconnectedness and it's also our ability to, to bring to the surface issues that are important to patients and families that may not be coming up um, through the system and services. So to make sure that we maintain, um, oh, sorry. And the third thing is actually to maintain our contact with our patients and families. We have very few opportunities to actually connect in with the patients and families that consumer reps are supposed to be representing. And I think that actually was one of the critical pieces that we found is that we found ways to connect in with patients and families, and then we were able to properly represent them. Um, so they're the three things, Anthony, I would say that we need to try and keep. And even do better. <laughs> you know, we've just started really. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Laila. That's a really um, insightful and considered um, response. And I think, you know, key, three key areas that we obviously want to see continue and, and build on. And Robin, I'm also really uh, interested in your thoughts about what yep. where to next with the system. How can we you know, embed these learnings in what we do next? Yeah, so um, thanks, Anthony. So the, I, I think really Lila's really hit the hit the nail on the head um, with this. I think, you know, there, for me, there's three three key things as well that uh, some of them incorporate what Lila was talking about. And the, the first big one's interconnectedness. So maintaining that interconnectedness will make you more robust to future challenge. Um, the second one is diversity. So maintaining diversity um, of, of the people involved um, as your consumer reps and also diversity of approach. Uh, because what that will do is it will allow you to reorganize quicker and be more versatile in event of other challenges because you you won't be challenged the same way twice. It's going to come out of left field. Um, and the third one, which I think you you've alluded to as well, is the learning. So just learning about well, how did we how did we do it this time, mm -hmm. and what about that can we take forward to apply to to future challenges that we come up against? Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. And Paddy, from your perspective as um, 
as the lead researcher here and also in terms of where you think um, what um, researchers can take away from this and sort of other questions that this raised, uh, what, what, what do you think the way forward is? Thanks, Anthony. Um, so I would probably add a little bit to what, what both Layla and um, Robin has, has talked about in terms of maintaining uh, and fostering that connectedness. So what I found in the research is that, um, and, and often Layla and I have um, talked about this at length, is often there are individual champions um, that really uh, are... Uh, uh, leading, uh, you know, those those connections and those are sort of a particularly driven, motivated individuals. Whether it be consumer reps themselves who drive those networks, but there are also exceptional leaders within, say, LHDs or within health organisations who are very, very supportive of consumer engagement, um, as well as in consumer engagement managers uh, who were. Um, I think one of the quotes from from the study was they encouraged us to stir the pot and like to drop you know like us to like us to sort of shake you know shake the system a little bit um, and not be afraid to upset the, the apple cart and they are the sort of the individual people who you meet in your everyday interactions that can really spur on and trigger the whether it be connections or you know uh, raising a particularly challenging aspect of, of you know of the agenda um and 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 that could you know finding those people and uh, you know give you know uh, letting them have more of a role um in connecting consumers i think that's really really important um and i think you know again back to diversity i think there's not just the, not just about diversity of the people but also diversity in practices and and it changes over time so what i found was that um you know some organizations will will do better than the others whether it be because of the resources or the champions or the leadership there and so sort of trying to understand how different organisations or different networks can learn from each other. I think that's really, really important. Um, and as researchers, you know, the more the more that we understand the context um, and what's been triggering um, these, uh, you know, these, these transformations, um, not just and not just focus on COVID. And I think COVID is a great example and a great, um, you know, uh, um, a, a change setter, but I think there's lots of others, and we've got a long road ahead, obviously. And identifying um, how to keep the momentum up as we go in the future. Thanks, thanks uh, so much, Patty. And I'm just noting uh, some of the the comments that have been added to the the questions, and um, we've got a comment, and uh, that um, what happened for some of the consumer engagement and the patient experience teams during COVID was that people were redeployed um, to work in, in clinical positions. And we've even heard of people who were redeployed to work in contact tracing and other important areas. Um, and, you know, I think, and, you know, the difficulty of um, making consumer engagement resilient when those teams were um, either disbanded or greatly reduced. And I think that that helps give the context around what we're, I think, we're, what we're talking about when we say um, engagement was brittle in the system. And when, you know, the shock came, people were, were redeployed quite understandably because there was a need for people in these positions. And, um, you know, what, what and, and the impact of that was um, um, engagement fell over in some areas. So thank you for that. I think that really helps. Um, with the um, um, with the context there, um, Lala, did there's something you wanted to add to that? Um, I just want to add that I think in addition to um, what we're learning from a consumer rep perspective, I th I, I think there were also some um, demonstration of value to the system, and I think that was demonstrated by the fact that um, some of the outputs of that we contributed were actually incorporated into policy work. Um, and I think what that what that means is that I think there was a recognition that consumer reps do actually contribute something um, that 
they can do it. They can self-manage, they can self-organize and they can actually contribute to something in a, in a valuable way. And sometimes when necessarily without the, um, without being organized by the, um, by the policymakers. And I think that, uh, that might um, also give some confidence to the system that there is a capability that's being built that supports this, them and, um, and the work they do. Thank you. Yes, and, and Robin, you also had something you want to add to this. Yeah, just something further to the question. I think um, the the sense is that uh, you know reengagement has not happened for, across the board. It's been a bit variable. Um, from the theory, um, it's important that reengagement be initiated soon so so what tends to happen is when you get this disruption you have a lot of energy and then after a while the energy dissipates and systems settle down again and if if you stay in an unstable state too long so if the engagement has broken and not recovered for too long it becomes very very difficult to then recover it because all the energy is gone so you might find that you need to deliberately re-energize some of the areas where engagement's not happened to to force that re-engagement that's a really, really timely point, Robin, because one of the things we're seeing now is, and, you know, admit, and we have to remember, of course, the time when this study took back, it, uh, took place. It was um, well over a year ago. And also now is the time when we are seeing some of those engagement processes um, come together and, and reform. So I think that's really timely to um, look at how we, uh, re-energize and not just expect that we can pick things up as they were and that we need to um, uh, do, do, do a bit more and, and, and reconnect with people. Because one of the things that we've also heard in addition to this um, research is consumers representatives telling us that they feel like they've been out of the, um, the discussion for a little while and like everybody else, um, who's been through the pandemic of feeling tired and um, uh, sort of feeling the need that maybe it's time to sort of step back a bit for them. So we really get, do need some extra energy to uh, re-motivate, reconnect and, and even you know, involve new people in the discussion. One of the really interesting um, um, things that's been um, coming up throughout a number of the comments and questions has been around um, the standard two um, from the, um, the national um, healthcare standards. And standard two looks at how health services are partnering with, with consumers. And some of the comments have been that um, some of the new standards that have been developed um, sort of haven't necessarily involved um, consumer um, engagement as, as the, um, in that process, but also um, I'm just wondering, um, one of the things that um, the standards have been very good at, or well, standard two has been very good at doing over the years is actually being able to measure process and activity, but we've always struggled to uh, talk about um, effectiveness. And, you know, sometimes, standards um, are very good at measuring things that um, some consumer representatives feel were um, at best ineffective or at worst just tokenistic, but that'll still get through the standards. Um, and obviously that's not true for everywhere and everyone, but it is a feeling we've heard quite often. I'm just wondering now, what are some of the things perhaps the pandemic itself and this work in particular um, could, um, could, could strengthen when we look at starting to ask that question about effectiveness of engagement, which is really what we're hoping standards and accreditation start with. Layla, I know this is a tricky question, but I might ask you to, for your reflections on that. I think there's two places to start with with that question one is from a system perspective and what the system um, would like to pick up and absorb and um, encourage and maintain and the other one is what the um, um, a more networked consumer rep 
group can actually bring to the discussion. Um, I think there, <laughs> there are lots of opportunities to improve it. I think that we've really just started and I think this is the beauty of people coming together. It's also bringing ideas together and it's also bringing new ways of working together. And I think that um, it will strengthen both um, system opportunities in how they'd like to work with consumer reps as well as um, consumer reps being able to take something back to the system that, that we can work with. Um, I don't know that fully answers the question, but it's a hard one because we don't hold... The, the, the resources to be able to make the changes. All we can do is um, do things that we can do that was that is within our remit and push the boundaries and see what sticks, if you like. Patty and, or Robin, do you have any reflections on this? Yes, Robin. Um, the, the part of the issue is, is what are the standards? So it's, standards are always about process. They're never really going to give you effectiveness measures. All they're going to tell you is, you know, are the processes in place? They're not going to tell you whether you followed them or not. So, so you know, you need to have measures within a health system, and this is part of <laughs> my frustration often with various aspects of the health system. You need to have measures of how well are they being followed, you know, how, how, how effective are they? And without those measures, you're never going to get effectiveness. So, um, you know, the, the best way I've found to, to change things is to actually develop measures. So if you can decide what are some important measures that will measure the effectiveness of this engagement, then you know you can start evaluating it, but often we don't even know how to measure it. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Robin. I'm just aware of time, Patty. Do you have anything you wanted to add to this? Um, no. Okay. Look, I'm aware of time, and I'm also um, aware of the number of questions and comments that are coming through on the um, uh, from participants, and realise we're not going to be able to get to to everyone. I did want to acknowledge a fantastic comment that's come through uh, from Terry Dawson from um, our um, sort of sibling organisation, a health issue centre in Victoria, about what Terry's observed happening in Victoria and that um, consumer networks are, are um, connecting and during the pandemic, uh, there was some good support that happened there. And that um, similarly to what we found in our study in Victoria, consumers were highly adaptive and um, engaged um, in the response and connected up online. And that post-pandemic in initiatives are starting to be re-energising and re-emerging out with the consumers. So that's good to hear. We've had a few questions about um, what we do next. Like, um, how, how were we interested in trying to replicate this work on a national or even global um, scale. Uh, I think we would be if we can resource it. And also what are we thinking of doing now around um, translation and how we actually can sort of take this forward into health services. I know at Health Consumers New South Wales, this is definitely going to um, influence our ongoing advocacy around um, health uh, engagement with health consumers and we'll be um, advising people on ways that we can um, um, embed that in their work. But I'd also be keen and I might start with with Patty around thoughts about what to next with future research and translation work with what we've done now. Thanks so much, Anthony. Well, I think um, the, the real beauty, obviously, of working with um, uh, Amory Hadley and also um, Trish and uh, Lee from ACI is that um, our work has already been recognised by um, uh, people within the health system who are working with consumers and patient experience very directly. So, um, and what I found is that there, I, I think, um, policymakers are very, very keen to um, bring in research wherever they can in terms of you know, how we're going forward. And I think um, there is a, there's a new um, uh, review. Is it called the Reimagining Con uh, Consumer Partnership? We might have. I don't actually quite have the right um, word for it. Layla, what is the what is the work that um, they're doing at the moment? Um, are we talking about the um, the experience the experience work that Anne Marie is leading? Well, yeah. Um, 
uh, <laughs> well, I think it's called something like the new um, consumer and community engagement framework for New yeah, South Wales is, is in the process of being developed. And, and I do know that this work and this uh, and the paper has been included in as part of the sort of reference material for, for that work. Um, but that work is just about to kick off by New South Wales Health. And I think, Anthony, if I can just um, very quickly just say one of the other things that will aid in the translation of this kind of work is the fact that now people have had a taste of what they can do. And I think because of the lot of the, a lot of the leaders came from LHDs from across the state, it gives them an opportunity to actually go back and say, well, why can't we do this? You know, let's talk about doing this. So I think that's probably one of the pieces that we were quite cognizant of at the time. Um, and that will be hopefully one of the legacies that comes from the work that that um, this is this is done. Thank you, Lala. I think that is an excellent point to leave on to to leave on. Um, and really, the challenge on us is to obviously try and find more opportunities to, um, for future research like this, and also. Uh, to, look at ways to um, translate it but I think the challenge for all of us and everyone who's participating in this today is to look for how can we take these findings and other experiences from the pandemic how can we take these back into our everyday work and build back better to use that cliche how can we make sure that the the next lot of systems that we create around consumer engagement are stronger and less brittle and um, we look forward to working with everybody about about doing that. I would like to thank um, our wonderful panelists today, um, Patty, Layla and, and Robin. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Patty mentioned roses and chocolates. I'd like to say they're on the way, but metaphorical roses and chocolates are on the way to you. And also a big thanks to the team um, at Achieve at the University of Wollongong. Um, the wonderful Professor Stacey Carter um, and all the team, thank you for your support. And the wonderful Tori, who's working away in the background. She's um, on the, the, the pedal car driving the whole machine and, and powering us and keeping us all going. Thank you so much, Tori, really appreciate it. Thank you everybody for taking an hour out of your busy day to be part of this conversation. And as I said, we look forward to work, working with you in the future on embedding consumer engagement going forward. So thank you all very much. Thanks Goodbye. So See you later, everybody.